Welcome investors to the Absolute Return Podcast, your source for stock market analysis, global macro musings, and hedge fund investment strategies. Your hosts, Julian Klamachko and Michael Kesslering, aim to bring you the knowledge and analysis you need to become a more intelligent and wealthier investor. This episode is brought to you by Accelerate Financial Technologies. Accelerate, because performance matters. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. Welcome, ladies and gents, to episode 52 of the Absolute Return Podcast. I'm your host, Julian Klamachko. And I'm Mike Kessler. Today is February 7th, 2020. A few interesting topics to chat about this week, and it would not be complete if we didn't discuss what's going on with Tesla, which is just crazy, insane. Its stock shifted into ludicrous mode, and it hit nearly $1,000 per share this week, and its market cap at one point was about $160 billion. We're going to chat about what's the driving force behind this share rally. In M&A news, Intercontinental Exchange made a takeover offer for eBay. Why did the market hate this deal? Spotify bought podcast company The Ringer. What's the strategic rationale behind this podcast acquisition? And lastly, we're going to chat a bit about value investing. That's right. Value stock staged a brief face ripping rally this week. Is a new cycle of outperformance of value stocks set to begin? Shares in the electric car maker Tesla, or Tesla as Elon Musk would call it, they've more than tripled since September as market participants have just become enamored with the stock. I was in client meetings earlier this week and that was pretty much how every meeting started. Like, what do you think about Tesla stock? It's crazy. Some people are thinking it's a bubble here uh, compared to the infamous rise in the late 90s of tech stocks such as Yahoo and Cisco. Uh, these uh, went up very quickly, uh, exponentially, which is really what Tesla is going through right now. Uh, back in the late 90s, Yahoo and Cisco hit the 2,000% appreciation mark, actually much faster than Tesla. So this situation certainly is not unprecedented in terms of just wild price action. Um, the stock, as I indicated, was sub 200 uh, in the second half of 2019 and peaked at uh, $968 and change and still remains well above $700 this week. Certainly well above Elon's 420 uh, takeover offer that was uh, a year or two ago. Now, there are a number of theories floating out there to explain the price action because it was really mysterious. This big exponential face ripping rally came out of nowhere year to date, the stock has just gone nuts. So there's really four potential uh, causes of the share rally. Uh, number one is there's been a ton of option buying, uh, call options. And what this does is it, it um, sets up the market makers such that they need to go out and buy the underlying stock. If they're selling call options, they need to go and buy the stock. So this is known as being short gamma, which is a uh, you know technical term on the options desk. But effectively, it just creates uh, a feedback loop of more buying and it just really amp amplifies uh, the respective stock moves. So as the share price rises and market participants are or speculators are net buyers of call options and the option market maker needs to go out into the stock market and buy more stock um, just to be fully hedged up on that trade. A second reason could be covering by short sellers. Now Tesla is a heavily shorted stock, which we've touched on in the past. There's 14 billion in short interest against Tesla. Now this makes it the most, I believe the most shorted company on the US uh, stock market. Been a number of hedge funds that have been burned on this one. Uh, the Financial Times talked about a European hedge fund, Odi, getting burned on their Tesla short. Greenlight was uh, obviously short for a number of years, but I leave. I believe they structured that just being too long put options, so not necessarily hurting as bad as one who would be short the stock. But nonetheless, it appears that um, short covering isn't 
the primary consideration here because short interest has fallen pretty dramatically from 25% down to 13% today. And combating that is the notion of the outstanding convertible bond. So as the convertible bonds rally, uh, convertible bond arbitragers, they would actually go and short more stock um, just to fully hedge up their position to have a, a, a correct delta hedge, especially when the converts are way in the money, as I'm sure there are here. So you have an increasing uh, short selling on the convert side, uh, and that is perhaps you know meeting what's going on the fundamental shorting side. A third reason, which I think is one of the main reasons for this tremendous stock rally, it, is just outright retail speculators going um, long Tesla shares. For example, on Monday, 12,000 Robinhood accounts bought stock in the company for the first time. Now Robinhood is the uh, notorious uh, free stock trading app uh, favored by millennials. And that could be a good indication of unsophisticated investors of buying the stock. In terms of trading volume, the trading volume was just off the charts for Tesla stock. Its volume over this week was triple that of Apple, but its market cap is only one-tenth the size of Apple. So some pretty significant volumes, uh, a lot of which is just uh, retail speculators going long the stock. The funny thing is, if you go into Google this week and type in the phrase, should I, and then the first thing that Google will suggest is, should I buy Tesla stock? Which is just uh, kind of indicative of the current zeitgeist and the attitude in the market regarding what's going on with Tesla. It's really top of mind with everyone. Perhaps the last potential cause of the share rally, some people point to fundamentals, for example, they did have a profitable Q4 in terms of you know whether those were robust profits. That certainly is de debatable. They did get their new China factory up and running. I believe they're producing Model 3 cars out of there. So certainly some positive news coming out. However, on the, on the other side, and short sellers would certainly uh, be the first to tell you this, they've never actually been profitable on an annual basis you look at the comparable valuations of other auto companies, GM, Ford, they're a small fraction of where Tesla trades and on a fundamental cash flow uh, profitability basis, Tesla, their net loss has averaged more than $1 billion a year for the past five years. So it's kind of hard to justify the company's market value increasing by three to fourfold over the past four to five months. Um, so it's really just uh, been an insane rally here. Luckily, we're not short the stock, but unfortunately not long the stock. Uh, in any event, those longs certainly are, you know, having a cold one this week, this weekend, having a, a great celebration. And anyone who has been long certainly has uh, been enjoying the ride. What are your thoughts on this crazy price action behind us? stock yeah I think one thing that Tesla has been really good at is really controlling the narrative around the fact that they're a growth stock now to fight back a little against that is that they delivered 112,000 vehicles in uh, Q4 this year which put them slightly above the bottom of their annual delivery range target, which was from 360,000 to 400. Um, so they're just above the bottom of that range. But then as well, if you look at past deliveries, their revenue in Q4 only grew 1% year over year. So this really isn't this massive growth company. And the reason why you have such a large increase in deliveries, but not a, a, and also an increase in revenue is because they're really significantly lowering their average selling price, their ASPs. And so that's through the Model 3, right? They're ramping up Model 3 sales. And yes. Model 3 is their by far their lowest price automobile. Yes. And so when you're looking at a business, I mean, one of the fundamental factors that you'd be looking at is their pricing power over time. And they're constantly reducing the price. Now, this is to increase their volume, but I, I guess it begs the question of whether that would be a great investment over the long term. You know, to get away from the fundamentals as well, just looking at the volume, as you had mentioned, Julian, and putting it into context, is that from Monday to Thursday's close, there was 196 million shares traded, which is 138% of their free float. Now, and, the and free those are expensive shares as well. Absolutely, at very high prices. Yes. Yeah. Yes, at very high prices. And so the free float is just the shares outstanding that are not held by insiders. Uh, but to put that into context, 
Last week, Amazon released their earnings surprise, which we discussed a little bit, but during the week, they traded about 7% of their float. So they, these are just massive numbers and massive volume. And so it really implies that they've turned over their entire shareholder base throughout the week. Um, as well, one other note on the volume is that a significant portion of their volume uh, has been from dark pools and that has been increasing as a proportion of their overall volume, which does lead credence into the comment that you just made about Robinhood accounts as Robinhood does sell their order flow to dark pools and so that does lead a little bit of credence into the fact that this is really just being pumped to retail investors. Right, so you're saying much of the volume potentially went to unsophisticated retail speculators. Absolutely. Right. And that makes sense from the perspective, as we indicated previously, that Tesla is a story stock. It's effectively, you know, the definition of a story stock where the price action of the shares re really is completely divorced from the underlying fundamentals of the business. As you indicated, sales up what one to two percent uh, year over year so certainly not a growth stock but certainly a glamour stock that definitely is top of mind gets front page news the other thing that we should discuss is the notion of uh, the popularity increasing popularity of esg investing everyone would certainly uh, point to tesla in terms of esg just given um no use of fossil fuels in terms of fueling their automobiles, given that they are electric. So certainly a big favorite of ESG and that style of investing is, is getting a lot of flows and they're basically forced buyers here. Another really interesting aspect in this whole rigmarole is uh, Elon Musk's compensation scheme, where the higher the stock price goes, the more he's compensated to, I believe, the, in the tens of billions of dollars, the higher the stock goes. And I believe uh, a large portion of this compensation gets uh, issued to him if the shares close above 150 billion in, in market cap, which it's right around that level. Now, some people would say, well, it incentivizes him to get the share price up, which uh, obviously other owners of the stock would appreciate. However, uh, conversely, a skeptic like myself would be like, well, this also incentivizes him to promote the stock and potentially manipulate the stock. So that's kind of another potential thing to consider. So just crazy action, but something that's even crazier, and I know a lot of uh, retail speculators got heavy into the options market on this one. And there were certainly some home runs. For example, the 1,000 strike uh, option rose from two cents to nearly $2 quite quickly. So that's pretty much almost a 10,000% gain over a short period of time. So if you're looking for a gamble, Tesla options are, are certainly where the action is. It's just mind blowing because more Tesla calls traded this week than S&P 500 calls. So on, on the the overall index, um, there's more Tesla stock option speculators out there than just the general stock market. When also with the options, I think I did see as well for options with a strike price of 1500 so you know, another double, uh, they were trading for I think around the $3 range. So I mean, as well, selling those options could be very profitable as well. And I'll reiterate what I've stated before in terms of story stocks. We never like being involved in these long or short because in my opinion, it's really just playing with fire. Uh, nonetheless, if you're long here, congrats, you know, celebrate a bit. Perhaps you're taking some off the table. And if you're short, you know, that's uh, it's real tough to go through one of these squeezes and definitely painful. Um, nonetheless, it makes for a, a great story. And I'm sure we'll be chatting about it in the future as well. There was a head scratcher of an M&A offer this week with the Inter Intercontinental Exchange, which owns the New York Stock Exchange and a few other financial product exchanges. They actually announced that they made a takeover approach for e-commerce company eBay. Now, this acquisition would exceed $30 billion. This compares versus ICE's market cap, that's Intercontinental Exchange, they are worth 50 billion. So this is really perhaps a bet the company deal where it's a significant size 
And this not only is huge, but it represents a huge departure from ICE's focus on financial markets. Um, obviously, uh, they started out in derivatives. They went to buy on to buy the New York Stock Exchange. So they're into derivatives, commodities, stocks, futures, etc. To go and buy a you know, consumer goods exchange was certainly causing many on the street to scratch their heads. And many thought it was very, very odd. Some background on Intercontinental Exchange. So ICE was founded in 2000 and it's really turned into a global exchange powerhouse really through M&A. They've had a substantial consolidation strategy that has driven their growth. They bought other exchanges aside from the New York Stock Exchange, including London-based International Petroleum Exchange in 2001. They bought the Chicago Stock Exchange in 2018. And that's really ICE's strategy is to consolidate, to continue to do these deals, which have paid off tremendously for shareholders. Their stock has done incredibly well. But my thesis on ice was like um, it was similar to a shark such that you know sharks if they don't stop if they don't keep moving then uh, you know they die it's the same thing with ice if it can no longer buy companies then they won't be able to grow they won't be able to consolidate make these cost cuts harvest those synergies and get its share price moving and on the financial product side i believe they're at the point where they can no longer buy any financial product exchanges just given antitrust regulations not just that but um, the sovereign country issues if they try going to london try going to australia or even canada and, and buying up those exchanges then uh, the government pretty much tells them to go pound cent so it's really a head scratcher of a potential acquisition in my opinion going from a financial products exchange to a consumer products exchange and the market probably thought something similar at least some shareholders what are your thoughts on this interesting to say the least potential transaction certainly very interesting and i will say that initially i was somewhat open-minded to the idea that there could be some synergies with regards to ice and ebay and their respective platforms that perhaps there was some technological overlap that they would be able to realize some value creation. Um, but following these real, really initial conversations with investors, you know, ICE saying that they're no longer looking at these strategic opportunities with eBay, it really makes it easier to believe your, your way of thinking about it is that this is really just like a stretch for growth outside of their core area of expertise. You know, if, if they had a lot of conviction with the idea of the value creation that they could, that they could have with this deal, a short term 10% share price decline really wouldn't cause them to walk away. Or at the very least, when they were interacting with investors, they would present an idea of the transaction and, and how this would work operationally that may be able to bring some of their investor base on board. But it really just speaks to their conviction. And, you know, I guess it really is a pretty good example of how investors typically are not very friendly to a really outside the box thinking. And, you know, this is kind of for good reason as that's a very high risk. And so, it, it, you know, which also when you mentioned this is a bet the company moment, you need to have a lot of conviction with regards to that bet the company moment. And if a 10% decline completely sways your thinking, then you likely as a management team didn't have a lot of conviction there. But one other thing that I was curious about is do you think that they leaked uh, this potential deal on purpose? Yeah, I just wanted to summarize for investors what exactly happened or what I think happened. So ICE had this potential eBay deal that they're talking to, to eBay. They leaked it to the press. Wall Street Journal published it because they wanted to see what their shareholders would think, i.e. how would our stock react? Stock did very poorly. ICE's stock dropped almost 8%. eBay obviously rallied on takeover speculation up 9%. Then pretty much the day after their stock got hit, they backpedaled uh, pretty much the fastest I've ever seen, dropped the takeover proposal and said, you know, we're not gonna uh, pursue this deal anyway. They also made the excuse saying, uh, blamed it on the other side, saying eBay had not engaged in a meaningful way. And as a result, 
It was not in negotiations regarding the sale of all or part of eBay. Now, after that happened, the share price is partially reverted, but still, I, some ICE shareholders are probably somewhat, uh, you know, walking on eggshells here, kind of nervous. What are they going to do next? And you got to think if they're no longer able to execute their consolidation strategy in their wheelhouse, which is, you know, financial product exchanges, derivatives, stocks, etc. What's next? Cryptocurrency? Going to buy Coinbase? Uh, shoes? They could buy StockX or perhaps one of these uh, many private share exchanges. There's lots of potential uh, I call them, you know, alternative assets or just, you know, odd financial exchanges because one thing that they do want to harvest as well is the data. Uh, ICE is big into harvesting and selling data um, to financial professionals. So that could be another play, but uh, interesting M&A strategy here, but good for them and listening to their shareholders and walking from this deal relatively quickly. Streaming company Spotify announced the acquisition of Bill Simmons' podcast company, The Ringer, which has more than 30 podcasts in its network. This company, The Ringer, is founded just in 2016, so around for less than four years. Uh, some of their podcasts range from an NBA chat show to one oddly devoted to rewatching of old movies. Nonetheless, this continues Spotify's strategy to really capitalize on the massive growth in podcasts. They're trying to pivot away a bit from streaming music. They're expanding their podcast offering. They actually acquired three podcast companies last year, including Gimlet Media, Anchor. They acquired those for a total value of $340 million, and Parcast, which they acquired for about 55 million and who knows maybe they'd want to buy the absolute return podcast i mean we'd consider selling for 55 million perhaps wouldn't we you never know but uh no outstanding offer unfortunately but spotify if you're looking for the most exciting and perhaps most insightful uh stock market and financial podcast out there you know perhaps we could talk about a deal on the absolute return podcast but nonetheless a few stats on the podcast industry here now there's close to a million podcasts out there right now 850 thousands 850 thousand podcast of which there are 30 million episodes a lot of choice out there i know what perhaps is uh number one or maybe in the top 10 51 percent of americans have listened to a podcast 90 million listen in the last month 62 million in the last week and really just growing like a weed one of the big growth industries podcasting advertising expected to generate more than 860 million in revenue this year and 1 billion by 2021 substantial growth there and i think an interesting analog is the chinese market they're way ahead of north america in terms of monetizing podcasts there's actually a, a different model there where I believe uh, podcast listeners, listeners subscribe and pay in the billions of dollars per year um, to get their podcast instead of relying on the advertising revenue. And if we look just compared to total digital advertising in the US, that brought in north of 100 billion. So substantial growth potential for podcast advertising. And that's perhaps, you know, some of the main reasons why Spotify is trying to grow in the podcast space. Terms of this Ringer deal were not disclosed, but if we talk about strategic rationale, Spotify seems to indicate they think they're buying the next ESPN in terms of sports coverage. What are your thoughts on the strategic rationale on this deal? Yeah, I think the strategic rationale really just comes down to the economics of the streaming business model is right now, Spotify's gross margin is in the 25% range, implying that they are giving out 75 cents on every dollar to the artists of revenue that they're able to get. Whereas for Netflix, for example, they're looking at about 62 cents on every dollar that goes out. So it's fundamentally a little bit worse than streaming uh, than streaming video. But really, the streaming business is just very difficult. And so what it's what Spotify's core belief is: they don't just want to be uh, streaming music; they want to be streaming all sorts of audio. That's their main focus. And so it's kind of their it seems to be their belief that there's a lot more flexibility with podcasts when negotiating. Role 
royalties with co content creators. And so when you look at, you know, where do they go from here after they integrate uh, the Ringer into their suite of content is it really wouldn't be surprising to see Spotify make them exclusive to their own platform. Now they haven't really done this with Gimlet Media, which they, as you'd mentioned, they had purchased last year, but Another option that would be kind of keeping it more of an open system would be to take big name podcasts such as the Bill Simmons podcast, which is one of the most successful podcasts of all time, and have that open to all platforms where within that podcast, they would provide exposure, exposure for all their new exclusive podcasts, which they would just have spot on the Spotify platform, which is kind of the same way that the New York Times has used the daily. Mm -hmm. Now that they've grown the daily to become a very successful podcast, but really it just highlights all the journalistic capabilities of the New York Times. Right. So they already have all that content. They just created a new medium to share it with consumers. Absolutely. And so really just bringing, bringing people into your platform. The one other thing that I'd like to point out is uh, that the ringer did actually have their, uh, I think it was about 60 or 70 percent of their employees unionize over last summer. Hmm. So that'll be something interesting to follow as the integration of the ringer goes into Spotify. Uh, but one other aspect that in terms of, you know, what type of revenue the ringer is bringing in, it was estimated that in 2018 that they brought in about $15 million for their podcast revenue. And if it's, we discussed the Barstool deal with Penn last week, um, if it's anything like that revenue stream, it's growing at a very high rate, effectively doubling year over year. So that number is likely a lot higher today. One thing I wanted to touch on, it's an interesting dynamic, your comment on margins, specifically in the streaming business being very low. And you got to think of a podcast as a very high margin opportunity. You look at someone like Joe Rogan, who's got the most successful podcast of all time, and he's min minting millions of dollars off, off each episode, likely and, you know, these things don't cost a lot, certainly a lot cheaper than making, you know, professional sounding quality music and putting an album out there. I know from our own experience, the Absolute Return podcast, of course, a five star rated podcast. I gotta be honest with you, it's not, uh, not the most expensive thing to put together, but certainly of the highest quality, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I think I heard that uh, a high quality podcast was about $10,000 per episode to produce, uh, which is substantially higher than, uh, than this fair podcast. Yeah, but uh, perhaps <laughs> that lends credence to our skill uh, <laughs> behind the podcast. In any event, congrats to Bill Simmons on this big win here. Clearly, uh, even though terms were not disclosed, uh, it looks like they're getting a, a big paycheck on this one. After being beaten down for many, many years, value stocks this week staged a brief face-ripping rally on Wednesday with some value funds rallying by over 4% on the day. Value stocks had outperformed glamour stocks by substantial margin over many decades. This is now what's known as the value factor, basically cheap or um, undervalued securities outperform expensive or stocks with high multiples on book value, earnings, EBITDA, cash flow, whatever it is, cheap tends to outperform expensive. However, the last decade, this has reversed. Been a very challenging decade for cheap stocks and you've had growth or glamour stocks really just crush it. Now it makes a question, does this green shoot this week signify a potential turnaround of the value factor? I know many value investors have been waiting many, many years for it to turn and the divergence between value and growth or glamour has just been getting wider and wider. Some details on Wednesday's move. Values return on the day represented more than two standard deviation daily move relative to growth and the broader market. And this is, goes back about 25 years. For example, a uh, trade of being long value, short momentum was up nearly 8% on the day. So not only did you have the outperformance of value, but you had momentum stocks really going the other way. 
That being said, it's only one data point. Really, value had been getting kicked in the teeth year to date, has underperformed growth on 83% of the days. Certainly been a very rough ride. What are your thoughts? Is this gonna be a turnaround for value investing or is it just uh, you know some fake news? You no, know, this is strictly my own opinion, but I really do think that this is setting the table for a very good run for the value factor. And I mean, it's something, I mean, I know a couple of months ago you had tweeted out pounding the table on uh, the value factor moving forward, especially small cap value, as that's being really beaten down even more than large cap value. But moving forward, I mean, in terms of an investment thesis, I am always weary of mean reversion, but the thing about mean reversion is when it is at extremes, that is when mean reversion can work as a strategy. And what we're seeing is just such a large extreme of value companies just being completely killed compared to growth. And I do believe that moving forward over the next five years, that this is a really good setup for the value factor. Yeah, it's an interesting point comparing uh, value or valuations of value stocks versus growth stocks. And I believe the divergence it now exceeds that of the tech bubble, which previously to uh, today uh, or this year had been the most extreme divergence of all time. And what happened after 2000, after the tech bubble burst, you had incredible outperformance from value stocks, I believe, compounding uh, 15% per annum of outperformance over uh, many years, perhaps uh, five to 10 years. So certainly I think the setup is there for value outperformance, but it's not gonna be next week, next month or next quarter. This is a long-term play as you indicated. And if you're looking for a value fund, like our Accelerate Private Equity Alpha Fund is perhaps the most value of them all, isn't it? I think our average multiple in the portfolio is less than five times EBITDA versus S&P 500 at rough, what, 13 times. So it's tough to find a cheaper, a cheaper stock portfolio than uh, Alpha, which uh, obviously trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange. If you are interested in taking a look at an uh, interesting way of playing this potential rally in value stocks on a go forward basis 2010s were the decade of growth stocks glamour stocks and maybe the 2020s will signify the re-emergence of value stocks it'll be an exciting time to watch and let's keep our fingers crossed and that's it folks for episode 52 of the absolute return podcast if you enjoyed the show please check out more episodes at absolute return podcast.com i implore you to follow us on twitter your handle is m underscore kessler and mine you can find me on twitter as the people's hedge fund manager recently changed my twitter handle to at julian klamachko that's k-l-y-m-o-c-h-k-o that's it for us. Wish you the best of trading, speculating, investing, short selling if you're into that, and we'll chat with you soon. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in to the Absolute Return Podcast. This episode was brought to you by Accelerate Financial Technologies. Accelerate, because performance matters. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. The views expressed in this podcast are the personal views of the participants and do not reflect the views of Accelerate. No aspect of this podcast constitutes investment, legal, or tax advice. Opinions expressed in this podcast should not be viewed as a recommendation or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any securities or investment strategies. The information and opinions in this podcast are based on current market conditions and may fluctuate and change in the future. No representation or warranty, expressed or implied, is made on behalf of Accelerate. As to the accuracy or completeness of the information contained in this podcast. Accelerate does not accept any liability for any direct, indirect, or consequential loss or damage suffered by any person as a result of relying on all or any part of this podcast, and any liability is expressly disclaimed.